The Central Bank of Nigeria says it remains committed to its developmental mandate of stimulating access to finance for the real sector. The bank also disclosed that the total repayment under the Anchor Bureau's program ABP as of February ending stood at about half a trillion naira, representing 52.4%, while the balance is not due for repayment yet. On Tuesday, the Apex Bank sent out a circular to all deposit money banks, mobile money operators, and payment service providers on the issuance of the operational guidelines for open banking in Nigeria. We have details of this news and more coming up shortly. Stay with us. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, just hold on in that case. Let me call out to my pin. Uh, it is four, one... Uncle, please stop. Stop what? You're giving someone else your personal identification number pin? Oh, not someone else. Uh, it's from my bank. Please hang up, Uncle. That's a fraud star. Th th that's not true. But, but they call out my full name. I am sure this is from my bank. Uncle, no bank is ever going to call you to ask for your personal identification number, PIN, your mobile banking password, or your card verification code, CVC. But it sounded so genuine. Yes. Hackers and fraudsters always sound genuine. But please, uncle, don't fall for their bait. Don't respond to any phony emails, text message, SMS, and don't click on any link you're not sure of. Even if they call your date of birth or your BVN, don't give them your security details. If you suspect any issue with your account, please go to your bank. Oh, I see. This message is from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Welcome back. We'll begin with the news. The Central Bank of Nigeria has reaffirmed its commitment to its developmental mandate and support for the federal government's drive for food security and economic growth. Accordingly, the bank welcomes applications from eligible Nigerian farmers and firms to benefit from its Anchor Burras Program, an agriculture intervention initiative. The acting director, CBN Corporate Communications Department, Dr. Abdul Mumin Isa, who disclosed this in Abuja over the weekend while exchanging views with journalists on the performance of the program, said ABP has supported 4.57 million smallholder farmers and cultivated more than 6 million hectares of land in the country. Quoting statistics from the Food and Agriculture Organization, Dr. Isa noted that the Alcoburras program has contributed significantly to the increased national output of local commodities such as maize and rice, peaking at 12.7 and 9 million metric tons in 2021 and 2022 respectively. It said repayments under the program are made through cash or produce by the beneficiaries and as at February ending stood at about half a trillion naira, representing 52.4% of total credit, adding that the outstanding balance on ABP loans was still under moratorium due to the COVID-19 forbearance the bank granted beneficiaries in March 2020 and extended to February 28, 2022. Tenor of loans under the Anchor Bureau's program is based on commodity maturation period. For instance, loans granted to farmers cultivating some perennial crops could have up to seven-year tenor. In furtherance of its mandate for financial system stability, and posturant to its role in deepening the financial system, the Central Bank of Nigeria has issued the operational guidelines for open banking in the country. The director, CBN Payments System Management Department, Mr. Musa Jimo, in a circular to all deposit money banks, mobile money operators, and payment service providers Tuesday said the adoption of open banking in Nigeria will foster the sharing of customer permissioned data between banks and third party firms to enable the building of customer-focused products and services. Mr. Jimo said open banking is also aimed at enhancing efficiency, competition and access to financial services in Nigeria. All stakeholders are required to ensure strict compliance with the guidelines and other regulations as CBN continues to monitor developments and issue guidelines as may be appropriate.
Nigeria is a rich nation of green land, rich resources, countless crops and commodities sufficient to feed and provide a means of livelihood for her teeming population. Chin up Nigeria, the giant of Africa, exciting times are here. We can be self-reliant and grow our economy if we work together to explore our potential. It takes a whole nation. Let us get involved. Buy Nigerian to grow Nigeria. Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin Emefile, said the quest for building a more sophisticated economy that is anchored on agriculture, MSMEs, industrial and manufacturing concerns has become the major component of the bank's monetary policy. This was contained in his address to finance correspondents and business editors at a seminar held a few months back. During the seminar, which held simultaneously in Lagos and Abuja with the theme Policy options for economic diversification, thinking outside the crude oil box. Mr. Mefile said Nigeria's population over the past seven years has been growing by more than 3% per annum against a less than steady output growth since 2019. Therefore, to ensure overall macroeconomic stability, expanding the production and industrial capacity of the economy must be given special attention away from over-reliance on crude oil revenue. He pointed out the need to work together so that the country can attain self-sufficiency in food production, employment generation, and improved standard of living for everyone. He made reference to some major leaps the Apex Bank had taken to diversify the economy through its numerous interventions. Speaking further on the theme of the seminar, an economist and the CEO B. Adedikwe and Associates, Dr. Biodun Adedikwe, explained the courageous steps that must be taken to win Nigeria from crude oil dependence and vulnerability. Here's the excerpt of his presentation. Now, why do we need to diversify government targets and revenue in Nigeria? I put six here. There are many reasons, okay? There are six of them. They are not a one. Is that fossil fear, which is generally called dirty fear is gradually going out of fashion because about 8% of fertilized export of Nigeria is under threat in that regard. If it is going out of fashion, that means you are highly vulnerable in a couple of years, maybe a few decades from now, when that particular source of energy will become irrelevant globally. Secondly, there is frenzied pursuit of clean and green energy to address climate change. Now, what are those specifics? Green bond insurances are becoming very prevalent. Not only that, other funding sources are massively flowing into development in this space. I was interrogating some research findings yesterday with respect to the flow of funding and you know, globally, especially with respect to ESG, that's environmental, social, governance. Now, cocktail of policies and incentives are driving the evolution of electric vehicles, okay, that is EVs. Number one, there is ban on internal combustion engines or also deliberately incentivized electrification. Then there's what I call the risky mindset and behavior that crude oil is everything. And I'm driving here. Mm -hmm. Everything we do, everything we talk about in Nigeria, the first thing we think about is crude oil. And in my own view, as an analyst, that's why I put that here. We are making a suboptimal utilization of resources in prospecting for oil at higher costs in another basis. And why do I say that? Sometime I think in 1999, I was involved in a conversation on Chinese TV 
all saw the mirror. And we were three. The third person happened to be the, I think the president of their association. And he said, the briefcase he came with, with samples of solid minerals, that the market value of what he had in that small box was about 250 million naira. So when we left the set, and I told him, why did you mention that value? Anyone could have heard you and made an attempt to come and attack you here. Because if this small box is worth that much, I said, in my mind, I can also imagine the world of solid minerals all over Nigeria. We are largely import dependent, and so to that extent, the demand for foreign currency will continue to grow. And if it is growing persistently, you again bring in what happened up until the 80s and 90s. That is, we were a net importer of non-oil goods. By the late 90s, then to 2000, when our refineries started having operational problems, we started importing with five million products. So we now became a country that is a net importer of both sides. That's where we are today. So next time. So the idea then of capital importation to bridge the financing gap was what we had in mind over the decades. Let's just get the money in, either by way of foreign investment or by way of borrowing fill the financing gap. That's why I said we look more at financial and finance without dealing with the fundamentals. So let's move on to the options. So, I mean, this is extremely, let's move on. I just thought about this. So what are the policy options? Now, there are so many things to consider in Nigeria that I put them in six categories. First, next one. So I put them there in six categories. Battle stars, seven I have there. Reform and rationalize governance. I put that first deliberately. Thus, in the convention I have with one of my very good friends here, Donnie Timbre, that any day politics will trump economic. The idea is very simple. You have beautiful economic policies, well documented, well designed, content well sequenced, internally consistent, it ticks all the boxes. But those four political actors <laughs> taking a decision can scatter everything. Then, of course, personalize the civil service and public service. There are two different things. Civil service talks about the ones employed that work for government. Public service is broader in scope. It involves also politicians who are in government. So that's why they make two different things. Okay? Then shift focus to industrial production, adopt PPP for infrastructure delivery, and of course reform and rationalize education and Medicare, and of course smart city, smart nation. Now each of them has a slide that we talk to very briefly, and then we can take questions and answer. Now, the structure of governance today is convoluted and costly. There's no doubt from my experience to date that financial system governance in Nigeria is expensive. So it's an area we need to look through as a nation and discuss with all seriousness. It's expensive. So but one important thing is we need to prune the number of ministries, mm -hmm. departments and agencies. And why is that so? Because some of them have dedicated mandates and also their responsibilities are similar. So we need to realign that. So the second one. Now, I said we need to professionalize both the civil service and public service. How do we do that? We have done the liquid new model of meritocracy and diversity in appointments. But the key thing there is that we need to identify MDs that directly drive the economy and then appoint proven professionals to lead them. Which means there are some ministries we need to identify as drivers of economic activities that should not be left to politicians as politicians. There's nothing wrong, for example, just to illustrate, calling my friend Ken Day here. Okay, he's a professional. And we want him to be in charge of a particular ministry that is economic in nature. But because he's a professional, we prefer him there. 
than the regular politician. And so he has a clear mandate, and he has his KPIs well defined. Now, there's a need also today to reduce the size of our civil service. Now, some of these, that's why we said the number of these options we are bringing here might not be easy, they might not be convenient. Thus, that way we recommended to President Jonathan in 2011 that if some states cannot stand alone on their idea, why don't you begin to consider major states? <laughs> well, we'll go back to the regional structure. <laughs> That's a tough one for the It's tough. Yes, you see, the whole idea is this. You start from generating an idea, then you take it beyond that by discussing it, interrogating it, and then now ask yourself, yes, it might be unpopular. But the question is, if you discuss it so much, you get to a point where you can bring out the five points and then talk about the disadvantages and pitfalls. And now, how do we protect those that are adversely affected? So now, that is how change happens. No change ever brings positive or true. For example, if we say, look, we are going to place a ban on the pollution of power generators. You know what? How people will react to that? Oh, okay. Say, ah, then we don't generate enough power. That comes to the national grid. Well, yes. But I've learned in researching the economic history of countries that no country ever developed this thing we are discussing today by keeping its borders open. Go and check the history. No country ever has developed by keeping its borders open. You cannot open your borders to import everything possible. So, so what's you can't get to that. Just check everywhere. Even the US, the number one promoter of open borders. I recall in 1982, I was there writing my doctoral thesis. The US came with a policy in countering the Japanese invasion of the automobile sector and said, We are not putting a ban on the pollution of Japanese automobiles, but we are putting a limit on the volume. That's so. In a year, not more than 2 million units of Japanese vehicles will be allowed to be imported into the US. That was in 1982. So, you can't just open your borders and allow everything to come. You can never go to do that. You need to rationalize this respect. There are a lot of wastages. You need to deal with that. Find the point to do it. I've already mentioned the second bullet point there. The five years ago, the police the point to spend it, and no revenue. Then, of course, effectively sanction corrupt and negligent civil and public service, especially errant leaders. The last of them are very important. We discovered this. Okay, if you are an advisor or a minister, now specify on paper what your allowances are. You are also not allowed to travel first class. You were allowed to travel the first class. That was an advisor. That was one of some paper appointment. We now find some ministers who had agencies and parastatas under them. Now it's called the parastata to buy them the first class ticket. So it will appear on the ministry's spending records. Where the parastata will buy them. Same thing with official accounts. Mm -hmm. Parastatas will buy vehicles for them and label it project cars. When the so called project cars are available to the minister to move. All of those ways are converting the rules when it comes to public spending. Number four, I've talked about industrialization, but what I would simply say is that the government must commit to make in Nigeria. That idea came from India. India has what they call make in India. That means we want to make the country conducive for manufacturing. I did some work on that in 2008. We branded it infrastructure Nigeria. Where we model what China did. What China did was very simple. Big railway, big roads, big drive ports all over China. So that any manufacturer can sign his factory anywhere without worrying about infrastructure. And the basic thing is this globally. Anywhere you want to build factories and offices, you lay the infrastructure in place. People will go there, they will leave. You build the roads. Build the railway. People go there and build their offices, factories, 
and water. So that is the make in Nigeria side. The made in Nigeria is a deliberate choice to buy what is made in Nigeria. Choice. That the shoes I wear are the shoes made in Nigeria. What I wear was made in Nigeria. Those are deliberate choices that we must show leadership for the top. The fifth one. This is very, very important. And this talks to our current debt situation. If we must borrow at all to deliver infrastructure, let the borrowing be done by private partners. We get value in terms of cost and quality, and also in terms of timing of delivery from the PPP model. So in which case, there's nothing wrong with borrowing, but it is always more efficient when borrowing is done by the private partner rather than the government. And in doing that, also, I've said this over the years, our top leaders must go out deliberately after those that have proven themselves in different sectors and invite them as partners. Don't wait for private operators to approach them. It should be the other way. That's what Ghana does. The Ghanaian government has done that to people I know, including my own clients here in Nigeria, to come set up in Ghana. It's not Nigeria that went to Ghana. Their government came after me. I have a few cases that are my clients. So our government leaders, operators must get out and go for people that can deliver the result. And the final one, number six, is to reform and rationalize education and Medicaid. We call them, you know, these are what we call productivity drivers, basically. Now, a country I will say we can look at today, we learn from, is China, when it comes to education. They fund, and then they have a deliberate policy that is like when their children go out of China to study, there's a deliberate plan to make them go like in batches. They go, they return. If someone calls or sends you a message that you have payment issues with your bank and requests that you reveal sensitive information, end the call and don't click. It might just be a scam. No bank will ever ask you for your personal identification number, PIN, mobile banking password or your card verification code, CVC. Scammers always sound genuine, but don't fall for their bait. Don't respond to phony emails or SMS and don't click on any dubious links. Even if the other party calls your date of birth or your PVN, don't give them your security details. If you suspect there's an issue with your account, the safest thing to do is go to your bank or call the number provided by your bank directly. Protect your bank details so no one steals your money. This message is from the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN. That's all from the CBN this week. Report on reserved banking issues to the CBN Consumer Protection Department using the email cpd at cbn.gov.ng attached relevant document. Call the CBN contact center on the phone line plus 234-700-225-226. Local courage may apply. Write to us through the email address from the cbn at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter for updates and to watch uploaded episodes of the program. We invite you to join us again next time. I'm William Missy Dada. Stay safe and bye for now.